Third flag. It's all over. AJ has done it. The checkered flag for Rick Mears. He's won the Indianapolis 500. In the Brickyard 400 to Jimmy Johnson. A racetrack that has made heroes of the IndyCar since it was built back in 1909. And NASCAR for over two decades since Jeff Gordon won that first Brickyard 400 back in 1994. NASCAR and NBC are back. We are at the racetrack and very excited to be there. But because of COVID protocol, we are actually at a different racetrack. We're at Charlotte Motor Speedway. We want to say thank you to the folks there for allowing us to be up here in the booth to call these races. I've got my friends with me, and I know that everyone is excited to be back at a racetrack, excited to be back watching. Now practice, which we haven't seen since the COVID protocol hit and the pandemic. Uh, but, Steve, July 4th weekend, we're right here at a racetrack, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a new tradition starting. Yeah, it's July 4th, but it feels like Christmas morning for me. We finally get to cover some cars on the racetrack, and I think 2020 is now the year of the unknown. You mentioned the COVID protocol. It's been 120 days since the Xfinity Series had any sort of practice. There was a break. When they came back from the break, it's been racing and only racing. The teams, the crew chiefs, I think got into that rhythm, got used to just showing up and racing, and now here they are at a brand new racetrack, a track they've never seen, and now they have practice. But I know there's a lot of excitement through the garage here. This is the Xfinity Series opportunity to have their own identity. They started down the street at the short track. Then they were moved at the Speedway, and they ran with the Cup cars. Now, on the road course with the Indy cars, it's their own opportunity to put their own footprint at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah, and what a historic weekend, obviously, uh, with IndyCar and NASCAR coming together on the same day. How about our drivers? We've got to bring in the mayor, Jeff Burton, and the newest member of the NASCAR Hall of Fame, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Guys, excited? Yeah, I mean, the excitement's real, but the nerves are real, too. Like Steve said, a lot of these guys, they're all seeing this racetrack for the first time. Some of them's had the opportunity to work on the sim and learn some of the racetrack, but the majority of the field has not been able to utilize the sim to get to know the racetrack. 11 drivers in the field are starting their first road course Xfinity race. It's going to be pretty exciting in these practices, Jeff. Oh, this is going to be crazy. I'm so excited to, to watch this. And, I, you know, what, I, what has struck me is the historic moment that we're in. I mean, who would have thought that we'd be running an IndyCar race, uh, a, a cup race, an Xfinity race, all the same weekend, the same racetrack, but two different racetracks within its own facility. And, it, by the way, it's the most historic racetrack in the country. This is an exciting weekend, 4th of July. I cannot wait to get going. And we get to see cars on track. That is a beautiful sight. Jeff, I'm going to let you know that I don't think this is just the most famous racetrack in the country. I think it's the most famous racetrack in the world. Well, Rick, it might be the most famous facility, but this track that these cars are on, good luck. This is the first <laughs> time I've seen a stock car on it. We had, uh, you know, a year ago, basically, Matt DiBenedetto came and did some testing for NASCAR to kind of understand the layout. There's a lot of opportunities to change the layout, different corners, but uh, this specific layout it's going to be new to all of us. Chase Briscoe right here in the 98 has to be one of the favorites. Hometown kid, an Indiana boy. He's excited to be racing at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah, already four wins. And Jeff Jr., we heard from Chase Briscoe. He made the comment that he's been on a simulator trying to simulate what this track has been like since February. Let's show everybody what the track looks like. Okay, so let's be clear. This is new to us too, right? We've not been on this racetrack. We do know this long front straightaway turn leads into turn one. That's going to be a heavy braking zone. A lot of pass in turn two, three, four, five, Junior. I think they're going to be pretty slow, but that five and six, that's going to be really important because it'll lead to that long back straightaway, a great pass the zone into seven. Absolutely. Hard braking zone into seven, then another series of lefts and rights through turn, through turn eight, nine, and ten. Coming around the bend of 11 into a very critical braking zone, turn 12. Very sharp. Right-hand corner there that leads to 13. Also, pit entrance right at the exit of turn 13 there off to the right. Then that turn 14, another a long sweeper, but also creating passing opportunities down the front straightaway. We talked about Chase Briscoe. He's been on that simulator since February, you know, trying to figure this racetrack out. He has a tremendous amount of confidence, a lot of IMSA road racing experience, won the roll hole, feels really good about his ability on these road courses, and he... He recognized this as an opportunity, and he has put the work in to try to get the result. 
on that short shoot and Matt De Benedetto told us as we mentioned he had tested here Matt De Benedetto told us that you never really go straight on that short shoot you're always kind of turning and he said that could be very interesting when they try to break if you're turning and try to break you could have a problem with your right front yeah as you're turning to the right coming up on turn 12 you're carrying that right front tire and it's unloaded and if you break while you're turning you will lock that right front tire up just as we see right here a great example of that getting into turn 12 i think that's going to be the most critical part of the part of the braking zone or any braking zone on this racetrack these guys are all going to be trying to turn drag that right front tire tear that right front tire up that's really going to hurt the handling of the car if it doesn't force them to pit lane so brandon jones get used to this road course and there he is that's entering turn one just so just trying to carry as much brake as he can you know i will say this if you're going to make a mistake that's the place to do it right when, when you go to a road course for the first time a really good idea is to pick your areas where you can experiment with your car right if you over if you overshoot turn one there's a lot of runoff you're not going to get yourself in trouble so i like to understand where how my car can break and it's okay to overshoot it no harm no foul just keep going, and now you've learned something. How about the highs and lows a week ago for Brandon Jones, Steve? He wins the truck race, and then he comes back the next day and out the first lap. Well, normally it's the next day. This was the same day. This was another historic NASCAR event, all three series running on the same day at Pocono. He comes out, wins this truck race, as you talk about, and then, oh, let's call it 100 minutes, 120 minutes later, he gets to run. I think technically a corner and a half here. You see a little bit of contact from behind, a huge accident for the 19. I talked to his crew chief, Jeff Mendering. He said, you know, I'd love to tell you what we know about Pocono, but what we know, we've raced there twice. We've run about 10 total laps, so we don't know much. It's been a, a little bit of a tough go at Pocono, but a good year for the 19 so far. Steve, interesting. We mentioned the fact that Pocono was the last race, and part of Pocono was patterned after Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Can people take what they learned from Pocono, which is the turn two, we call it the tunnel turn, and use it at all when they come to this racetrack? So it's funny because the, the course designers say it's turn two. The crew chief says it's turn three. While the radius of the corner is very different, the banking is very similar. The loads of the car is very similar to Indianapolis. So, you know, it's not, oh man, Cindric is making the S's look pretty straight and simple. You know, the loads are the same. You can learn something, but they are totally different when you get to the four corners that the cup cars will run. But the road course here obviously is nothing like anything we've seen. That was my question for the drivers. So, guys, we see Cindric here in the 22. I was watching some in-car from IndyCar practice earlier today, and Burton, I lacked depth perception. The track itself is so flat. There's no, no high curbing. There's no valleys. There's nothing. It's really kind of out in the middle of nowhere within the confines of Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The other thing about watching IndyCar practice, and I experienced this when I went to Canada for the first time to run a road course, is that I watched a lot of F1 races from Canada. And I went there in an Xfinity car, and the speeds are so vastly different, it was like I had watched the wrong race. I had watched <laughs> the wrong racetrack. So that's why practice for these guys is so important. As we look at, you know, these 14 corners, Junior, long front straightaway, this is you know, going backwards from what a customer is seeing, they're driving actually into what is the oval turn four, going backwards down the front straightaway. Yeah, this is a heartbreaking zone. Great passing opportunity. Restart's going to be wild getting down into turn one. Turning left into two, right into three, right into four. Really nimble through here, trying to keep the back of the car underneath him. This is critical right here through five and six. It's a little left-right kink but you've got to get through there fast. Watch this, because this leads onto this long straightaway. You mess that up, five and six, you're going to get past here going down the straightaway into turn seven. Yeah, that's going to be a huge braking zone, which means a passing opportunity. You can see Jeff Burton, he's rolling in behind Austin Cedric, knowing that Austin's going to be the guy to set the pace. He wants to try to learn something. Now, this little section, look how slow they look like they're going, but that car is right on edge. Watch this, a really sharp 90 degree corner. Now a long sweeper. 11 is just a sweeper. It just goes forever. Got to carry a lot of speed, but now you're going to have to brake while the car is turning. That's going to be hard on that the, the inside edge of that tire, trying to lock it up. And now a very, very sharp corner again. He's going to hit pit road, but that sharp corner will lead all to the front straightaway. And that, again, is going to be huge. 
because of the passing opportunity at the end of that straight. And you see, if you see that pit entrance right there, pit road speed starts there. So he's got to run hard all the way to that mark. A lot of time can be made on pit entrance there. A lot of guys need to be practicing pit entrances every time they come off the racetrack. Practice that as hard as you can to try to take advantage of that in the race. And a good transition as we see Austin Sendrick bring the 22 back into the garage area, the pit road garage area. We're going to go there. How excited would Austin Sendrick be if he could win this race for team owner Roger Penske, who also now owns Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Kelly Stavis. Yeah, and Rick, how exciting for me to get to actually be here, not just because it's a historic uh, weekend of racing ahead, but as you said, Roger Penske and his team have made so many improvements to this speedway, and we start right here in a new and improved victory circle. Well, yes, Austin Sendrick and the rest of the field would certainly love to be. What's cool about this is there is now a lift for victory lane down below, which will actually take the winning vehicle up top, put it on display which will be really cool, but that's just one of so many improvements they've made around here. On the other side of the pagoda, you're going to find a 100 foot by 20 foot media wall, which shows uh, footage, on track footage, along with timing and scoring. That's perfect for the fans. There's new fencing, new picnic tables, uh, new 5G Wi-Fi available, a slew of new monitors around. Three new acres of sod, 400 potted flowers, 150 trees added. I have to tell you, this place looks and feels new. And Rick, one question I saw a lot of fans asking about on social media was the bathrooms. And yes, they're all new too. They've been improved. So just a great, great job. It feels like a whole new place. Hopefully the one thing that will never change, though, of course, that yard of bricks, yeah. Rick, at your start finish where uh, winners will be kissing it all weekend long. Well, we can't wait until fans can come back and experience this in person. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for taking us through that. And one of the other things that Kelly and Marty both said is Roger Penske is hands on. Yeah. Like he is literally walking the grounds, checking out all of the things at this facility, making sure that they're up to his standards. Well, when you think the name Penske, it's not just racing. It's a success in business. And you can't have that much success with certain work ethic. And that's what we're seeing, right? We're seeing Roger Penske walking the ground, seeing the improvements. You mentioned it, Rick, as great as this day is, and it's unbelievable. I think this is just the, the precursor. It's the teaser for what we're gonna get to expect when we see fans back. For a fan to be able to go, guys, and see IndyCar, Xfinity, and Cup cars all at the same facility, what a great weekend. Fourth of July weekend in Indy, kind of finding their own mark, taking over this weekend from Daytona. I, I spoke to someone yesterday, and they said they did a media event, a little small media event at the racetrack, and when they rolled through the tunnel, they saw Roger Pinsky carrying a ladder. <laughs> you know, like he was out, he was literally out there carrying a lap. And and am I surprised? I mean, you know, that's what Roger does. He everything he touches is first class. Does it the best way he knows how. So, let's I was ride along say, here. Yes, we ride along here, guys. In my mind, as a crew chief, I'm breaking this up into two sections. Right? You have this one set of turn complexes at this end of the racetrack, another straightaway, and the other end. From your guys' opinion, what you've seen so far, which do you think is going to be the most difficult corner for handling? Well, I'm just really surprised how slow they're crawling through this road course. Some of these sections, this looks like a big, wide racetrack, obviously really fast through this part, but down this long straightaway. Some of the, the slow left and rights, turn two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, all those, they're creeping. Watch this right here. Justin Haley through turn seven, eight, nine, ten, really slow, trying to keep the back end of the car mentioned slow that tells me rear grip is going to be a major issue on old tires listen to rpms too i mean it, <laughs> that real rear wheel spin is going to be an issue you're that right there having to lift in that sweeper look how early that lift is getting into this corner oh Turns we got well. one backwards right there and into the grass he's all right we'll hop it down in there probably your battles here. You guys mentioned the word slow, and yet the slowest I saw on miles per hour was probably about 55 miles an hour. These turns would be, they're sharper than maybe an off-ramp when you come off the interstate, and you're supposed to only go about 35 there. These guys are flying. Yeah, they're just creeping around some of these sharper corners, just looking for grit. Here's Sieg. Just cooked it in there a little bit. Yeah, a little bit too deep. 
Probably got the rear, rear brakes or the rear tires hopping. But again, that, that's okay. I yeah. mean, you know, look, there's nothing to hit right there. That's an okay place to go find the limit of your car. That's, it's so important on road courses not to get yourself in trouble where, you know, there's walls, there's, there's other things can do damage. This is earlier in the, in the day oh. in practice. Inside, inside. Yeah, Brett Moffitt there. That's a conversation as well, guys, as spotters. You know, this is the first time on this racetrack. There's, there's, most teams have three spotters. So, Jeff, I had a conversation with Jason Burnett this morning about that. He told me that NASCAR is going to require their primary spotter to be located in NASCAR 1, which is basically the last set of corners for the road course. While that's good for communication, I have a little heartburn because I don't see that as a big passing zone. I'd love to have my spotter either at the end of the front stretch or the back stretch. That's not going to be the situation that NASCAR's provided. So I've always determined that, you know, Rick, it's really always up to the driver when it comes to braking zones. If I have a spotter out there, I'm going to explain to him, hey, you let Dale Jr. going down the straightaway, right? You got a little bit of pressure. You're going to have to use your mirrors to decide whether you're going to block that run. Josh Williams in a turn one. Gets an air too deep. Saves the splitter. You know, the one thing I'm noticing around there, and I had some concern, is all this runoff is grass. I thought there was more gravel. Sieg is having a heck of a time trying to stay on the asphalt. Why that matters is yellows, right? I'm already thinking ahead to the race. What kind of race are we going to see, Rick? Are we going to have a lot of yellows for fuel mileage? I've seen a lot of cars off. Everyone has been able to continue, right themselves, and get out of the grass. So this may have more green flag running. Same corner again for Sieg. Well, actually, into turn 12, he's okay. Turn 13. Oh, just no rear grip. Is that a, is that a, uh, a, I guess a byproduct of trying to find the edge? Well, you guys always talk about running right up to the edge. There's not a lot of rubber, uh, Goodyear rubber down on the racetrack. There's some Firestone rubber from the Indy cars. So I wonder how those are reacting with each other. A lot of times when we have different tire, tire manufacturers or compounds at different racetracks, there can be a big issue with how those work together or work against each other. You can see as they're putting a lot of rubber down on the racetrack, it's really going to make the, make this racetrack change throughout these two practices. You know what I saw right there was grass on the grill, Rick. We'll have to watch yeah. that later in the race. Overheat could be an issue. Well, the hottest driver right now in the NASCAR Xfinity Series is Chase Briscoe in the 98. Let's go back to Kelly for more on Chase. And you guys mentioned him being an Indiana boy. Remember, he told us he would climb the fence and kiss the brick should he win here. But so far, there's a few issues for Chase Briscoe. He reported to his team that something was going on with the transmission. He said it sounds like it's getting stuck in second or third gear. So unfortunately, uh, due to the social distancing, we're not allowed to go back into the garage. So we're just going to have to keep our eye out for the 98 and listen in on the scanner to see if they get that issue fixed. You know, Kelly just mentioned we talked to Chase Briscoe, and he talked about how important Indianapolis was. But how about this? The first Brickyard 400 he can remember going to was this right here when Tony Stewart, another Indiana native, in 2005 won, did the burnouts, climbed the fence, and then Tony came back. That duel with Kevin Harvick once again climbed the fence. A nimble Tony Stewart right off the fence right there. And then you see kissing the bricks. Guys, I have been on race teams, never been fortunate to be a crew chief, but I've been on Jeff Gordon's race teams when he's won the Brickyard. There is no better grimy, oily, disgusting kiss than you'll ever have in that yard of bricks. I remember, remember when Tony Stewart, remember when Tony Stewart climbed the fence the first time, he had, his sponsor was Home Depot and said, Tony, next time we'll bring a ladder. Don't worry. Hey, also remember Rick Zipidelli, yes. the crew chief for Tony Stewart, when he was kissing those bricks, well, he's crew chiefing right now for Briscoe because his crew chief has been suspended for a few days, yep. so he's the crew chief on that car. Take a look at this vantage point. Yeah, this is on the front bumper of the 16 car, A.J. Allmendinger, Adrian Ag Solutions. How long is this going to stay on there? <laughs> well, I hope all day. This is one of the best shots, so I hope it's there the whole time. A.J. is one of the best road racers in the sport. Currently third. He's only got a couple laps on the racetrack. I expect him to go up the board, if not go to the top of the board here in a few laps. There you go, up to second. And AJ's not a, he's not a full-time racer in the Xfinity Series. He just kind of takes a few different rides uh, with colleague racing and actually got his first oval win earlier this year. So he was very excited about that. What an advantage this is for Haley, 
and those guys on that team, that he's a part of their program, helping them go to the sim, work on the setup, get the balance of this car pretty close as they show up to the racetrack, then be able to get a couple of practices to further tune that race car. If I was any of those guys, Chastain, Haley, I'd be doing every change he makes, change my car. I don't even know if it works. Put it on there. I want to do. You, I want you to do everything that he wants to his car to my car. You saw on the dinger he, in five and in turn five, he missed the corner. Just trying to carry a little bit too much speed through there. Never got to that blue and white apron on the bottom of the racetrack. This will be a great shot. The restarts. This shot right here is going to be crazy. Imagine what it's going to be like in turn one. If you would have two favorites for this race, they would be at the top of the list right now. Cindric and Almendinger, is that, are we in agreement? Well, I, like, there? I like Cindric because the Penske car tested here, and it wasn't Cindric driving it, but they have that information, and that's, that's an advantage. And then Almendinger, of course, just his ability and talent. Well, you talk about ability and talent. I think we all forget perhaps the resume of A.J. Allmendinger. You know, I know he had a stint in the Cup Series, which he wanted more success. He would love to have won more Cup races. But this is a driver who has won in a ton of major series, right? He's won in IMSA. He's won in Cup. He's won in Xfinity. You see right here, five IndyCar wins. Back when it was Champ Car as well. Xfinity Series 3, a Cup Series win, an IMSA win. That is a lot of win. All but one Xfinity Series win. All of those have been on road courses. That's why he's a favorite, Rick. This is a guy that not only you talk about a brand new track that they're learning, he's won in every style of car he has got in. Oh, by the way, that IMSA win, that was the 24 hours of Daytona. So if you're going to win one, you might as well win the big one. And I had talked to AJ uh, earlier. I said, okay, so how much experience do you have on this track? And he goes, well, actually, this track, zero. He said, but I did drive an IMSA car there back in 2013, so I remember that, but it's not the same configuration. I think the other thing, for a big advantage for Almendinger, Steve, you talked about it a lot during uh, road course races when he was in the cup level, is the pressure that was on his shoulders, right? They had to win those races because they really didn't have the equipment to win at ovals. Right. That, all that pressure got put on his shoulders. Well, tomorrow, he just has to go race. I mean, he just gets to go out there and just bang gears, you know, make stuff happen without all that pressure. And I think that makes him even that much more dangerous and that much better to be able to race free and race the way that he's comfortable with without feeling all that pressure. Kelly, is there another one of those Wallace racing boys down there in the uh, garage and on the track today? There sure is. Mike Wallace, you see him there in the number zero car. Uh, making his return to the track for the first time since 2015. And you see the very patriotic looking paint scheme he's got there. Well, there's a bit bigger purpose to it, and that's to feature U.S. Marine Corps veteran Danny Garcia in his Honor Walk 2020, which kicks off this weekend. It's a four long month initiative where the 75 year old Vietnam veteran, former law enforcement and ordained minister, will be walking. Uh, between 25 and 50 miles per day. He's been doing this since 1996. He's already taken 52 million steps across six continents, and he's raising money for the America Salutes You, which really um, benefits veterans, first responders, um, and active military. Um, so that's what this paint scheme is all about, is, is Danny's wife will actually be joining him, riding along in an RV to support him with the same livery that we see here on Mike Wallace's car, but just a, a very cool initiative for this team. Great to see Mike Wallace back out on track. And the walk, by the way, is scheduled to end. I said it begins this weekend, scheduled to end October 29th at the Grand Old Opry for an America Salutes, Benef uh, Salutes You Benefit concert. So very cool stuff happening here. Yeah, amazing. 25 to 50 miles a day walking that much. That's uh, great awareness, obviously, and uh, very honored that that veteran is bringing a more awareness to things like this. You see Jeff Burton right here. He'll start first tomorrow from the draw. So an interesting thing for Jeff Burton, I was talking to his crew chief Taylor Moyer this week about how they're prepping, and Jeff Burton was out west working with Ron Fellows, actually getting some road course experience, a little bit of laps under his Whoa. belt as he smokes the right hand tires under that corner right there. Let's listen in what the eight has to say on the radio. I don't know if it's the shifter or, or what, but on my up shift, it just feels kind of jerky. I don't know if it's, that's normal or, or what. My down shifts are good. My up shifts feel kind of jerky, like when I let off the gas and I put it in. 
gear. So guys, you know, he says, I don't know if that's normal. This is, I think, one of the challenges for teams like the eight, who has a bunch of different drivers. Dale Jr., you've been in this car, right? We're gonna see uh, Jeb Burton in this car. We've seen Daniel Hemrick in this car. So without practice and a variety of drivers, just how tough is it to get comfortable? Junior, you had the green flag, no yeah. practice down in Miami. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you spend a lot more time probably at the shop during the week, getting in that seat and understanding that you're not gonna have a chance to really tune anything up. Uh, before the race starts, lucky for Jeb, he's going to have these practices to get the car more comfortable. Slides that right front tire. You do not want to do any of that in the race. Worst thing is for Jeb, it's his first Xfinity road course start, and he's on the pole. He's got the whole field breathing down his neck going to this breaking zone in turn one tomorrow. So interesting thing, I was told that Jeb Burton chose Indianapolis when it was still going to be the Oval. <laughs> Ran so well there a year ago. Said, I want another shot. I think I could go make it happen. And then it was... Oh, yeah, by the way, it's We're not the change. Oval anymore. We're going to run the road course. But, Jeff, you said, he said, you know what? I'm committed. I'm committed to Indianapolis. I want to go run some road courses. So he stuck in the eight car, had the chance to move races, but didn't take it. Yeah, and he, he, he has been working on his road course racing, and that's what he said. He's like, hey, I've been working hard on road course. Let's go, let's go make it happen. Let's go and see what we can get done. And, you know, he's run a lot. Well, not a lot, but several SVRA Pro-Am races, and he had a, he's had a great time doing that. But he's embraced the challenge of coming here and running a road course. He got the Ward Burton Foundation on that court. Can, can I say it like that? Or I'd say Ward. Ward. The Ward Your Burton family, Foundation. you get away with whatever. So the, we got a couple nephews in the race because uh, Jeffrey Earnhardt is also running in this race. Uh, but Jeff Burton, obviously, Jeff, your nephew. And we'll throw in a son. How about Harrison Burton? How proud are you? Two wins already this season for Harrison Burton. Yeah, they've had a really good, really good rookie year. Uh, you know, we talked about it. Junior and I talked about it when he went to Miami. I'm glad I'm not a rookie this year. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> no practice. No, I mean, good gosh, that's got to be hard on, on all these rookies. Uh, and, and I think that he's done a really good job. Uh, last few weeks haven't gone the way he wanted it to, but that's racing. That's just how it's going to go. Yeah, one of the younger drivers in the field, only two teenagers. You got yeah. Harrison Burton at 19, him and Cody Vanderwall, the only two teenagers in the field. So you talk about, I wonder if that's good or bad, Rick. You know, I ask myself, you and I, we're a little stubborn. We're old, we're stuck in our ways. But a 19-year-old, he doesn't, ah, whatever, where yeah. are we going, where are we racing? I think there are sometimes, while the experience is a detriment. They don't have the experience of some of these tracks. I think the flexibility of some of these younger drivers shows up. They're willing to try anything. Just a reminder, though, as far as the way the rookie program normally worked, is that a rookie would get an extra set of tires whenever they would go to a racetrack because they were able to practice more on those extra set of tires. Well, now they're going to these racetracks and they don't even get practice. This is the first time since the COVID pandemic hit that they have been able to practice at a racetrack. As we look at the playoff standings, and Harrison Burton looking so good up there already of the four drivers that have won and locked themselves into the playoffs. Two wins for Harrison Burton. Oh, and boy. going the wrong way. Justin Allgaier is backing up, missed the turn. You want to use all four gears on the racetrack, not the fifth. You don't want to use the R. The R is nothing you want to see on the racetrack. Looks like he missed turn 12. You're all cleared. He's coming around turn 11 right there, up into this braking zone. and. Oh, yep, there's that right front lockup. Where I feel like the right front's going to be the most vulnerable is this turn right here, getting into turn 12. Yeah, you're almost turning as you're braking, so all the weight's shifted over to the left side of the car. That's why that right front's locking up. Well, you guys talked about Almondine and Cindric being the favorites. Well, how do you not put this guy in there? Yeah, that's true. I mean, he's won three times on road courses. He's extremely hungry. You know, the year hasn't gone the way he would, has expected it to. I have to put him in there. Yeah. I'm looking at the, the, the times right now, and Almondeer is going to have his work cut out for him. If he doesn't, you know, I'm sure he's going to pick up a lot more time over these next couple of practices. But the first, on the first lap on the track, Cindric goes out and runs a 130.70. That's almost a second faster than Almondinger, who ran his 130.31.45 on his third lap. So Cindric's fast right on the racetrack. Let's listen in to Allgaier's radio. Really hard, you can see the lock up so the right front getting into that corner right there now with whatever change you made. Something I want you guys to watch too, look at the seven car. Look how the tires are on the ground, right? 
Remember the 20 car had the front tires were off the ground as he was turning? That's just completely different looks at setups. How stiff the back of the car is, how stiff the front of the car is, shocks. You don't ever see that seven car pick a tire up. Now you know, I always thought when, when you see a car hiking up, that's telling me you got a lot of rear grip. A lot of good rear grip. I always liked it. I always enjoyed that about our cars at Sonoma when we would hike the, the inside tire, turning, uh, turning through the corners because it was going to load the rears and grip up the rear tires. It looks like these guys are struggling for rear grip in the in the back and forth. It is a huge weekend at Indianapolis Motor Speedway and racing fans. You can enjoy it all. Track pass. The Xfinity Series final practice will be coming up at three. NBCSN has IndyCar Series Grand Prix qualifying, and then, of course, Dale Jr. download. Paul Morris will be the guest. That's 6 o'clock tonight. Tomorrow, huge, huge day. IndyCar Series Grand Prix at noon. That's on NBC. Countdown to Green kicks it off at 2.30 for the Xfinity Series, and they'll be racing from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway road course, just like the IndyCar Series that has just come off of it, and then the Breeders' Cup Challenge Series. That will also be on NBC at 5 o'clock. And IMSA is in Daytona. They're at 6 o'clock. That will be on NBCSN. And then Sunday, what a big day for everyone. NASCAR America pre-race and Countdown to Green will be on NBCSN. And on NBC, once again, the Brickyard 400. Hollywood game night at 8. It is a very full, full weekend of racing and we're glad that you're joining us for this weekend rick we're gonna have to show a different car because it's fourth of july it's warm outside and those contact bars are looking good i'm getting hungry since we're socially distanced we can't share what we have over here <laughs> <laughs> thanks so you know dale you mentioned about the pace and austin cedric definitely had it. that first lap was very impressive but i'm looking at the long run speed you know while pace is important Track position is always the key at these road courses. Um, I don't think we have any idea how far the drivers or crew chiefs could go on fuel. Neither do they. I've yeah. talked to three different crew chiefs, and they are guessing whether it's a one-stop or a two-stop race. But regardless of that, a driver's job is going to have to be take care of those. You keep talking about locking the right front and spinning the rear tires. Those tires have done to last you however long the crew chief decides you need to stay on the racetrack. This is a smart move by Jeff Burton here, don't you think? He waited until... He saw Justin Allgaier go by. Now he's following him, kind of learning what Justin Allgaier is doing at the track. It's the second time we've seen Jeb do that. I, listen, I think that's extremely smart. The, the best thing I ever did to make myself a better road racer was at a test. I could not keep pace with Mark Martin. He was trying to talk me through it. He was trying to help me, and it wasn't working. Finally, I said, I just got to follow you. And, and I did, and I picked up time. And from then on, I always ran better at Watkins Glen. Just that perspective of how much he was beating me getting into the corners where he was beating me where I needed to have that time that was the best thing I ever did not that it worked real well but it was the best thing yeah Jeff's back uh, outside the top 10 in practice at 14th right now on a 133 on his last lap he's got 11 laps on the racetrack just about the, as many as anyone else and that has 12 but 11 laps, he's out there putting the time in. All right, so Rick, you mentioned it. We are going to see two completely different series, two completely dis different disciplines on the same track tomorrow. And here they are, an IndyCar and Xfinity car. Thank you to Team Penske for pushing these two cars together, Fame, Gasoline Alley. But just look at the difference. Look how sleek and low and light that IndyCar looks. The big, heavy, overpowered stock car for Austin Sindrick. I think this is one of the most fascinating things of the weekend is watching competitors appreciate the different disciplines. And here you have it, Austin Sindrick and Precio Award. I tell you, this is going to be fun to watch because the different speeds, the different cornering, the different braking, it's so much different. Think about this, over a foot taller for an Xfinity Series car, that's one thing, but you're talking double the weight. They're close to the same length. The horsepower reasonably is close to the same, but I'm telling you, when you start talking horsepower to weight ratio, which is the most important thing, that Xfinity Series car is like driving a big, heavy tank with too much power for the rear tires you have. That Indy car makes a ton more downforce, is half the weight, much more nimble, yet they're both going to compete on the same circuit. A-plus job. All the powers that made this come together, I couldn't be happier. This is something we've heard the whispers, right, for a decade. Jeff, about we love to get IndyCar and NASCAR together. 
we finally are getting to see it. It's just, it's going to be fascinating to watch the races back to back, right? And see the speed differences and where each each driver and each series wants to make passes. And, and the speed difference is going to be immense. The, an IndyCar is going to make so much more downforce that they're going to go around these corners and are so much lighter. I mean, it's a major difference in speed. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable how much faster an IndyCar is going to look. What I like is the race car drivers, and I'll include you two, Jeff and Junior, how especially IndyCar drivers have said, I want to run an Xfinity Series car. I want to run a cup car. I want to be able to see what you guys do. And so many times we see you guys that are NASCAR drivers say, hey, I, I'd like to give that IndyCar a try. Another young driver, 21-year-old oh. Riley Hurts from Las Vegas, Nevada. You see right there, a little sketchy under braking. Just an interesting story here. A young, young driver with a very veteran crew chief, Dave Rogers, at the helm. Think about Dave. He's got 18 cup wins, 20 Xfinity wins. He knows how to coach these drivers. I had a long conversation about what it's like to work with this young driver. He said, you know, he was excited to get the season started. But as you mentioned earlier in this show, Jeff, the lack of practice he thought has really hurt Riley, just not having the time in the car. He said he does a nice job by the second half of the races, but these races are so short that he kind of you know, the, you lose a segment or two kind of learning the track and you're already behind. Doing a nice job. Hopefully this practice will help him here at the road course. It, it's, it just is impossible to replace lap time. Simulators, all that stuff is awesome, but lap time just cannot be replaced. We talked about speed and, and the difference between the Indy cars and the Xfinity cars. Well, it's about 20 seconds. Think about that. An Indy car whips around that racetrack 20 seconds faster. That tells you how much grip difference there is. And imagine how different you have to drive them. I can't. I can't imagine yeah. the difference. <laughs> Told you at the top of the show, this racetrack was built back in 1909. And then they ended up repaving it, actually putting bricks down. They put over 3.2 million bricks down on this racetrack. And then when they resurfaced it, they took all those bricks and they put them, well, they put them in a lot of different places. Junior, I know last year when you went to the Indy 500, you and Rutt started going through some of the creeks around here and finding some of those old bricks. Well, was that the inspiration behind Lost Speedways? Because I know that that is going to be premiering on Peacock July 15th, and you've told us a lot about finding these old, old racetracks. Yeah, I've been uh, very passionate about looking for old abandoned racetracks for, for over a decade, created a map on my computer of over 300 plus racetracks. And so now I've wanted to do this TV show for three or four years. We finally got down to business and me and Matthew Dillner, there you see him on the, on the screen with the king. We go to these racetracks and we tell you their story. We, we learn the story with you in real time. We go to these tracks really with no knowledge of, of what, it's, what we're gonna find and it's really incredible. We find a lot of tangible evidence of the track actually in, in, in the uh, area. But we also learn about the people that race there uh, and it, what it meant to the community. We talked to a lot of people in the community as well who experienced racing at these tracks. Uh, it starts July 15th, there you see it, on Peacock, which is the new streaming platform for NBC. I'm excited for people to see it. I won't lie, I've got a sneak peek at a few of the episodes. It's pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, I just, the stories, as you mentioned, just hearing the stories of these old racetracks and, and the legends that race there. Yeah. That's the fun part. See, Justin little, Haley, little. on top of the screen there, Justin Haley has moved into second. And we didn't talk about him very much, but that's a guy that's going to be a factor as well. Tell you. AJ yeah, you, we, you mentioned it in some conversations we had, Jeff, how he's, he's got some real good talent on the road course, but he's also leaning on Almendinger as his teammate, dialing these cars in. They are going to be tough. They're going to bring the fight to Cindric tomorrow, I'm sure. We're taking a look at the 07, piloted by Jake Buford, and he's a 32-year-old out of Houston, Texas. And this is going to be his first Xfinity Series start. <laughs> this is about as challenging, I think, as, what do you think, American Ninja Warrior? Because he's done that twice. He's been on there twice. He likes a challenge, apparently. I love it. Wearing the helmet. This is an A-plus move for a race car driver. 11 career sports car wins, so he definitely knows how to road race. Talk about 
athletes and race car drivers. I'm a crew chief, so I don't have to prove that I'm an athlete, but uh, Bert, you and Dale Jr., we're going to get a course. See how y'all do in the Ninja Warrior course. We're retired. Oh, <laughs> so it doesn't count. Oh, okay. Yeah, hey, Cedric, so. Cedric come off of pit road, went out on the racetrack. His fast lap was a 130.70. He goes out on lap eight and runs a 130.78. Don't see anybody with that type of speed still as we're late into this practice. Good looking car for 07. You see the 07 and 08. Jay Buford, Joe Graham Jr. We see now there's Austin Cedric, the fastest here at. Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the road course. I just ask myself how much pressure this young man's going to put on himself. Oh, Dale, you talked about no speed line until this yellow line right around the corner. Farther around than I thought, all the way down to there. That, to me, looked like Austin Sindrick planning green flag pit stops. He was hustling down that access road. Yeah, I'd hope that you'd tell me as a crew chief to be doing that every time I come to pit road. Here's Austin Sindrick getting a win at Watkins Glen on the road course, beating Almendinger for that victory. Is that what we're going to see tomorrow? Well, we know he's going to be uh, challenging him. Yeah. Too far ahead of Indianapolis Motor Speedway is to compete at, at the ovals, right? He's been fast, but no trophies. When you look at the Xfinity Series, you can kind of make your way to the playoffs with success on the road courses. But if you want to be a champion, which I know this young man wants to be, you're going to have to see some speed on the ovals. Talk about speed on the ovals. Noah Gregson, he's found some speed on the ovals this year. Second year with crew chief Dave Ellens. He's talked about how that relationship has really blossomed, has a lot of confidence, getting behind the wheel of the nine car and going to victory lane this year. When we talked to him, that you, the word you just used, confidence, he is definitely, he has got a lot of confidence right now, and that's good for this young man. Got a lot of confidence to use all the track. He was all the way over the curves into the grass. Hey guys, A.J. Allmendinger back on the racetrack, off pit road, goes and runs a 130.15 to take the top spot in the practice right now over Cedric. 130.15 to Cedric's 130.70, as you see Noah. Big wheel hog. I never yeah. know. <laughs> he had it all. Wheel hog, lock up. You know, Noah, is, Noah is, he's a good road racer. You know, he won in the K&N Series, run, won road races. What was interesting to me, we talked to him the other day, Steve, is he talked about how he drives, because, you know, he drives really hard and really aggressive because he thinks it looks cool on TV when he watches the replay. <laughs> like, he wants to be the guy. He wants to be that showman. I thought that was really fascinating. Def, I believe he said I want to create a wow moment every time I go out on track, something that will look good on the highlight reel. And we certainly see Noah Gregson do that plenty of times. You talk about his road racing skills. He's only been to a school once. He said he went to a track down in New Mexico where he kind of tested in a Miata and a Legends car. That was really to work on his braking techniques. But he said other than that, he's really just self-taught. And it's through the time in the K&N series on those road courses as well as the truck series that's really helped him kind of hone in on that uh, on those skills and he says the confidence well that comes from truly believing that every week they show up they have a car that can win their race I thought it was interesting when I asked him the question about you know how big is it to go and be able to race at Indy he said you know what honestly it's the journey for me it's how hard I work to get to this point and to get potentially the wins than it is actually racing at a certain racetrack. I just want to win, and I know the journey is how I'm able to win. It's been a journey. This lap is a journey. He's been out of the groove a little bit. You talk about a journey, you talk about a hard charge of the showman. Well, he's shown aggression right here. Canadian Motorsports Park inside of Todd Gillen. They both make contact, they both go around. Haley kind of got through the accident, went to victory lane, and then here he is in the Xfinity Series car at Bristol. That's his teammate, mind you, the seven of Allgaier up the track. That was this year. Somewhat of a controversial move, but he pays off. I think you can get away with those moves if you go to victory lane. I would be irritated if you put that move on me and didn't win the race, but he proved it was a needed move. Team owner, I'm going to leave you out of it and not make you be the referee at this point. But if it happens tomorrow, I am going to make you be the referee. I'm going to know your opinion. <laughs> well, that first shot, 
from Canada. That was his teammate too. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So. Oh, so you're saying there's a consistent trend? Yeah, there's a trend. <laughs> well, he said what he said the other day. They don't ask how; they just ask how many. That's the truth. Right, that's what he said. No showing favorites as these two cars enter turn seven. Well, another hard charger right here. The ten of Ross Chastain. He uh, he is not afraid to be aggressive. Is that so? Uh, wait a minute. Polite way to say. Yeah, you said the word aggressive. Now. Eric Jones was watching uh, a couple weeks ago, and he tweeted out, he said, these guys aren't showing each other any respect. So is there a difference between showing respect and being aggressive? I'm going to I'm gonna leave this up to the drivers. That's where the less the fine line that you walk. Case right? by case. Yeah, yeah. it's every, case by case. Every driver has their own code. Yeah. What one driver thinks you know is over aggressive, the other driver <laughs> I'm going to tell you, right, I mean, when I see things on the race, it's taking me longer to figure out whether it's aggressive <laughs> or just bad manners. <laughs> See why I left that up to them? Because they didn't answer your question. They just talked in a complete circle, which tells me that's the problem with drivers, right? Is, is everyone has a different line. Well, one thing we do know is calling racing, you know, has is, is, had some success the last couple of years. Their first win, Ross Chastain at Daytona. Look at that, the top three. The calling cars. Sweating the night. This team's come a long way in a short period of time to become one of the most competitive teams in the series with a real legitimate shot at the title this year. Yeah, Chris Rice, I'm, I'm going to give him a lot of credit. Um, general manager, I think it's his title. It's changed a few times. But he's the glue in my mind for Matt Collins, the team owner and the sponsor, to kind of keep all the wheels turning in the right direction, doing a nice job to get them to work together. You remember the first, first time I ever saw Chris Rice, crew chief and for Elliot Sadler, 1996, at a late ball stock race in Myrtle Beach. I got one further. Oh, yeah? Chris Rice's dad, Alan, and his uncle, Earl, worked on my late model. Wow. I raced in South Boston Speedway. <laughs> oh, man. I've known Chris since he was seven years old, 16 wow. years old. That's awesome. Mike Wallace here. We showed him for a little grass. There's such a great piece earlier about that paint scheme. Well, think about this. Mike Wallace, fourth all time for his Kennedy Series starts. We're going to see right here. This is heading down into turn one. I think we're going to see this a lot, guys. He already has grass on the grill, which tells me he's already found the grass once. Drive for JD Motorsports. So I'm worried. If I'm a crew chief instantly, right, I'm making notes. Grass on the grill. Grass in the ductwork. These are the things you're going to have to maybe run a little bit more grill opening. Leave myself some room because there will be trips through the grass. And drivers on the right side there, well, actually on one, on the left side, they put up signs 400, 300, 200, 100, right, for braking zone. So you go to a sign or you go to a spot on the track. I'm a, I go, I'm, I'm a field kind of guy. I never really use reference points or visuals to, to decide my braking. And I just kind of went until I went too far and then backed it up a little bit. <laughs> I own, on road courses, I was sign guy. Everywhere else, I didn't use signs or references. I just used my field. But. That shows you what I, I, I had no confidence in myself on road courses. That's why I was using signs. <laughs> well, you can catch the action from NASCAR, IMSA, American Flat Track, and more with Trek Pass on NBC Sports Gold. Don't miss a green flag live, commercial free, and on demand. You can learn more at NBCSports.com slash Track Pass. And you see what is happening this weekend that you can get on Track Pass. Rick, I've become a huge fan of track pass. Oh, as you see Mike Lynette off track here. Just, you know, racing. I get to catch Everything. racing from everywhere all yeah. the time. It's so much fun. Once again, you good now. You good. Just at the beginning of that corner. You know, the interesting thing, guys, we've seen a lot of cars off track as we see another replay. Dale Jr., you've mentioned it multiple times, the right front tire locking up. No damage to any of these race cars. So that tells me. You know, it's going to be an interesting day. I don't think a lot of cars, when I look, think of attrition, I think a guy's getting into barriers, wrecking race cars, not being able to continue. So they'll definitely run into each other. But I think as a driver, guys, this is a track that kind of invites you to be a little aggressive because mistakes, while you may lose time, you kind of get to get back on course and try it again. I'm forgetting. Unlike the Roval here behind us, Rick. Kelly. Hey, Rick, you saw a brief shot there of the 93 headed back to the garage. There's another familiar last name. That's Myatt Snyder behind the wheel, and he's been having some issues. It sounds like he's the uh, car's just not picking up the throttle. He said it was weird. He got to the apex of a turn, and it seemed like um, it was a funky noise first time around. Second time, it was just like the motor wasn't pushing. They brought it back. I heard at one point uh, the crew chief asked him to take the 
air box out. Um, didn't hear what else they do, but then they put him back on track. Now he says he's experiencing it in four corners. He thought maybe it was a rear gear issue at one point. Whatever the issue is, and hopefully we'll be able to, to get a diagnosis, is just uh, cutting out a lot of valuable practice time for Maya, who's, uh, I think, right there on the cut line for the playoffs and certainly wants to have a good showing this weekend. Yeah, Maya Schneider, a driver who just announced a couple weeks ago that he's going to be running full-time, but it's not with one team. He's running full-time with different teams. Uh, right now he's in the RSS Racing, number 93. Take another look at this. Wow. Yeah, Jeremy Clemens, he's got... Not a lot of rear spring in that thing, and the, as it's squatting down and picking that tire up, just try, he's just trying to, you know, increase rear grip. And as he's changing, and, and also help the cars directionally change direction better, like go left and right through the through the series of corners. He's six fastest. So, you know, that shows you we've been looking at different platforms. Some, some cars want, all four tires on the ground, some, you know, tires way off the ground. I saw Jeremy, well, he is. He's got making good speed with it doing that. Yeah, if, I, if my car's sliding in the rear and I'm slow, I'm going to tell Steve Letarte to make that thing hike up a little bit. And I'm not going to do it because I don't <laughs> like anything about what I've seen on the fence. Like, the theory's there for the rear tires, and I hear what you're saying. But the problem is on, on restarts, you cannot be aggressive when your car tumbles and rolls, tumbles and rolls. A guy with a flat platform like an Indy car is going to try to take advantage of you. And I think that's what's going to hurt this 51. But, guys, just the simple fact that Jeremy Clements is in a race car, I think we all need to be reminded this is a small team, a family team down in South Carolina. This is a race car driver that in 2004 driving a dirt late model almost lost his hand. 311 Speedway, the drive shaft explodes. It severs his right hand over 10 surgeries to reattach it, to make it operational. I'll be honest, until I heard that story, I didn't know. You would never know. He has all the function. He's a great race car driver. He's a road course winner. But what an unbelievable comeback story about a guy who wants to be in a race car so bad. He said that was the driving force to recovery. About a year, Rick. About a year it took in physical therapy and he's back behind the wheel. Yeah, the family has been uh, working with racing engines for many, many years. Actually won Road America in 2017, Kelly. Yeah, what a day that was for this small team and for Jeremy Clements and his dad, Tony, with all the confidence him in the world, says if he could get in the right equipment, he certainly could have a lot more wins on his resume. Coming off a top three finish, a third at Pocono, so they've got a little momentum heading in here. But the big challenge, as you guys talk about, this small team, they have no engineering department. They have no simulator they get to go use. So while Chase Briscoe's been racing this track on a simulator, every week since february and we've heard other drivers like noah gregson say they've gotten to spend a few hours on one this driver right here jeremy clements had to find video online and just watch an onboard from another car to figure out how to get around this track um we see his, we see his car getting in the air there i know early in this practice he said he was losing rear grip needed more forward drive we'll see um what they can do with this 51 uh, with just a few small resources on the team. All right, guys, two minutes to go in this practice session. Who do you like? Well, Allendinger at the top of the board right now at a 30-15. Cindric is fast. Briscoe's right there. I mean, all the names that we've, we've, we've thought would be there are there. So uh, the guys that are fast are obvious. They are the ones we pointed out. Allendinger, Cindric, Briscoe, no surprise. I am a big Justin Allgaier fan at this point right here. He has run a ton of laps at 13, the most of anybody inside. Well, Gregson's now run 15, but a lot of laps tells me he's working on his long run. I don't think he can go outrun Almendinger and Sindrick when it comes to raw speed, but Jeff, when I think of Allgaier, I think of veteran, I think of experience, as we see right here, Brett Moffitt wow. with a flat left rear tire. These are the types of things I think Allgaier can avoid. Look at that. Just made his way back down pit road. Wise to stop there, right? No more yeah. damage. I, I think it's going to come down to Almendinger and Cindric. I just think those two are going to be the fastest. They've been the fastest in practice. They have the most experience. I just think it go, it's going to come down to those two. Almendinger, he must feel pretty good about his car. He's already climbed out of it. I'm sure that they will, however you do that social distancing, you will debrief right. crew chief. Uh, but obviously they will be wearing masks as well and staying six feet apart. Uh, but that's one of the new things, too, that they've got to learn because they haven't had practice before this. This is the first time the Xfinity Series has practiced since the break for COVID. You mentioned the break for COVID. 
not that it was good for anybody, but the timing couldn't have been better for Brett Moffitt, the driver of the 0-2. He runs full-time in the Truck Series, part-time in the Xfinity Series. Mid-March, he breaks both legs, fractures both legs in a motocross accident. I talked to him the other day. Uh, he actually looked pretty good walking around. He said, you know, they're healing up nicely. I said, so, you know, is there any pain? Yes. He said, <laughs> yes, very quickly. I was wondering how he's going to handle a road course. Guys, as a race car driver, the ovals are one thing. But road course, you're using both legs all the time, heavy braking. It will be interesting to see how the injuries and the rehab holds up at the road course here at Indy. He more than likely won't notice it till he's done. Yeah. It'll be extremely painful for sure. There's the red and black flags indicating that that ends the first practice. They'll have another opportunity to be about back out on track at 3 o'clock Eastern. As we look at this, the five drivers in the field with the Xfinity Road Course wins, all five are in the top six in practice. So, like we talked about earlier, no surprises, right? I don't think anybody's surprised about that top seven. Not. I am a little surprised, though. Josh Balicki down there, he not only has pretty good speed, but out of the five laps he ran, his average speed is still pretty good. He's in the top ten on average. Another name that we usually don't see there, Preston Partis. Good speed out of that number 36 car. And again, a reminder, we do have more action that will take place from right here at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, of course, the final practice for the Xfinity Series at 3 o'clock. IndyCar Series Grand Prix qualifying is at 4.30 on NBCSN. And, of course, the Dale Jr. download with Paul Morris at 6.